All right, starting from scratch. Acknowledgements. First and foremost, ponyradio.ru, that is everypony.radio.ru, Marvine and the entire team for inspiring me to do this series. You guys do an amazing job. It's a Russian language podcast lecture series that um, covers pretty much the material that I want to cover overall when we're done with this entire series of podcasts. And Marvine in particular for talking to me in depth about the subjects that we're going to talk about today. Though that discussion was very inspiring and a lot of fun. I also want to thank others whose material I'm going to be using um, to a certain degree with or without their knowledge necessarily. Um, that would be an anthropogenes.ru, um, Sokolov, Zhidnyov, Drobyshevsky, and all the other scientists who contribute to the idea of popularization of science and whose good work is really what allows people to get interesting, brand new, up-to-date material out there available to people like me who are not necessarily in the technical fields that they are in. And all these guys that I'm referencing, they are scientists, researchers in the field, and their work is much appreciated. And especially the, their willingness to talk to the general public about the research that they do do. All right. So, I'm just going to start if anybody else joins us great if they don't we had somebody else try to jump in and jumped out all right so we are going to cover today neanderthals and denisovians which is one of my favorite subjects and it's one of the greatest mysteries in my opinion of human history um, especially the early human history these are the parallel humanities these are the real trolls and elves hobbits and gnomes that we see in our everyday movies, video games, read in fantasy books about, fantasize about when we're children. It's the magical other humans that we no longer have with us. They are something that has been and is still being very hotly debated. They are creatures that are very similar to human humans as we know them today, and yet starkly different. They are people that even scientists, for various reasons, most of them are really research related and uh, scientific reputation related, have nonetheless gone to an extreme degree to de dehumanize since they've been discovered. And the more we learn about these creatures, the more we understand that they were not that different from the modern humanity. Now, something that I want to uh, clarify right at the start is definitions. I believe that these three species that we're going to be talking about, and some of the other ones that may still be undiscovered, but nonetheless, there are signs of them existing, or there are traces of them existing, they're all humans. So the term human, when applied to modern human beings, is not really appropriate to use. So for the sake of this podcast, I'm going to use the word Cro-Magnon when I'm referring to anatomically modern humans. That is not exactly an accurate usage of the term, but it is a convenient label and I guess a placeholder to distinguish anatomically modern humans from the other two humanities and any other humanities that we may talk about during this podcast. So I'm going to start with Neanderthals because they have longest and best known of all the alternative humanities and probably most misrepresented ones. Um, on the Denisovians, there's really very little information available, but what we do have available is very interesting and is worth covering. And of course, cro -Magnus is what's generally referred to as humans today, though there is a great diversity that has originated not only from the original Cro-Magnon out of Africa population, but from the different meetings and interactions of different human species. So imagine this, your tribe has been traveling for days from, sun, from sunrise to sunset for as long as you remember yourself, stopping at times, breaking camp, hunting, tending to your sick or ill, and then traveling again. You have been traveling for so long, you do not remember where you're coming from or where you're going. 
and on the late at night around the campfire, you elders can tell you a story, a distant memory of a land that was much warmer, with many animals that you could hunt, a land that was an equivalent of what we would call a paradise, a land that eventually got depleted, where hostile tribes drove your ancestors off their ancestral lands, and your tribe began its slow and never-ending journey, following the endless herds of orcs, horses, and other prey animals from horizon to horizon, following with their migrations, walking and walking a little bit every day, slowly encountering new places, new climates, new territories. You yourself, of course, don't remember anything different than this experience. It's always been like this. Everything is familiar to you, the forest, the trees, the animals around you. It's a day, your group, and there's not that many of you, maybe a couple of dozen, that's all the people you have seen in your entire life. You moving forward. And as always, the young men, the strong hunters are scouting ahead and your tribe chieftain, and the strongest of the adult males are forming the peak of the formation. And the older men and women are forming the perimeter. And of course, inside you have your children, your babes and mother, mothers and the elders and infirm of the tribe. And of course, the women are carrying all the scarf because the men need to have their hands free in order to be able to hunt or to protect the tribe from any attack that might ensue. And it's a day just like any other day, you're traveling as you always have. And suddenly you hear an excited call out from the scouts ahead. And one of them runs back and begins whispering something strange into the ear of the chieftain. And you're watching this great man's, this great leader's face and his face turns pale and his eyes grow big. And of course the women and the children, they start forward, crowding forward, eager to see what, what is it that so surprised your brave scouts. And as you peek in between the shoulders of your brethren, up ahead you see another person standing who looks so much like you and yet nothing like you at all. He's shorter, he's very large, he's stocky. He almost looks like an animal. He's wearing furs, something that your people never have done before. His skin color is different. His hair is different. His face is so very different from yours. It's almost alien. And yet from that face, that strange alien face, looking right at you are intelligent human eyes. That would be the experience that human ancestors would have had at some point in time when they entered either, Eura well, basically entered Eurasia and different groups had that experience at different times. This is the beginning of a story of love and war, of collaboration and cannibalism, of teaching each other and genocide, of exchange of ideas and cultures. And this is a, the story that made today's humans what they are today. Because without that meeting, that encounter, without that push to and challenge by something that is different than yourself, humans probably would have not moved forward with their progress. Progress as usu is usually driven by difficulties. It's also oftentimes triggered with encountering something that is competitive and yet similar to you. Um, births of human cultural evolution really appear at those times and not just human, any animal evolution. When you have hybridization events, when you have mixing of different species events, that's when you have most variability and most uh, ability to adapt, to evolve and to change in different directions. Now the question of what is a species? That is something that we all know from elementary school, more or less. If two creatures can breed together, they're not a species. In the, well, if they can breed together and their offspring are also capable of breeding, both male and female, then they are one species. Now, if they cannot breed together, or if they can produce only offspring of one sex or the other sex that is capable of reproduction, then they're different species. Modern science really has complicated that subject very much. As an example, um, you all have heard and still hearing about the climate change, which has driven the um, 
distribution area of the brown bears into the polar bears regions. Now, these are two distinct species with very different morphology, hunting habits, social behavior. Um, polar bears are primarily carnivores to where brown bears are more of a omnivores. Their hair structure, their flotation ability, their cold endurance, everything is very different. And yet those two species, which are now oftentimes con are considered to be one species, happily and eagerly reproduce left, right, and every which way. That's just one example. Another example is I personally know of a case when in a zoo, a mountain lion and a domestic cat, a male domestic cat and a female mountain lion were able to produce um, healthy offspring. We all know that various dog species, canine species can uh, admix to different degrees and produce offspring that are also capable of reproduction. So the question is whether these three species that we're going to talk about, uh, the Cro-Magnons, the Neanderthals, and the, the, the Denisovians are one species or three completely different species is something that is up in the air. They were distinct enough from each other, from what we can tell, to be different species and to be labeled and given their own species. But then again, within each species, there was so much variation because each species covered such a large region and such a large just span of space and time. There was so much variability within each of those groups that it becomes a question of scale and degree. But right now, conventional science does see those three groups as very distinct. And I'm going to cover the Den Denisovians first because the least is known about them and it's a quick and easy cover. Denisovians were discovered fairly recently. Um, I've mentioned in the last episode that just a couple fragments of bones were found in the Denisov cave. And uh, DNA was extracted from those bones and it was discovered that that DNA was significantly different from the, uh, ne both Neanderthal and uh, Cro-Magnon DNA. So that's how Denisovians as a species were identified. Nobody knows what they look like. There's a good suspicion that there is probably their skulls and remains in museums all over the place. We just don't know what we're looking for yet. So that's about all we know about the morphology of the Denisovians. Um, we know a little bit more about their behavior. And the Denisov cave and uh, in the vicinity of the Denisov cave were all three species, Neanderthal, Hum, uh, well, Cro-Magnon and uh, Denisov uh, populations were unknown to have lived at similar times. Moreover, they are known to have interbred with each other. Uh, there have been certain finds um, that severely predate such inventions in Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals and that date to about 50,000 years ago, which is roughly about the same time that Denisovians, well, all three species really occupied the region. And the items that are found are fairly sophisticated items. We are talking about diadem, uh, head decoration that's carved out of mammoth tusk. We're talking about rings for the fingers. We're talking about bracelets and other finely crafted artifacts that are not seen generally in even later human population um, past the SH period. So um, from what the scientists have been able to deduce from very few remains they have found, especially the very large teeth of this uh, hominids, is that they've had very large heads and there's great suspicion that their brain capacity was greater than the both of the, of the Neanderthals and the modern humans. So that's pretty much all that I'm going to say right now. That's just a general overview of the Denisovians. Now let's get back to our Neanderthals who are, are our counterparts, our frenemies and our scapegoats. So Neanderthals were discovered in a German cave. Originally, the first specimen was discovered in 1856 and it was a 40,000 uh, year old specimen. And it's the type specimen, that's the specimen that is used to identify species by. And at first, much controversy was happening around this particular specimen because um, it was one of the very few finds. It was right at the beginning of the acceptance of the evolution theory. There was much search for the missing link ongoing right around that time. And uh, at first, people thought that it was a much more recent um, remains. There was even some suggestion that it might have been a Russian 
soldier who died during the Napoleonic Wars and or got wounded, crawled into a cave and got found there somehow. Um, but when uh, people with more experience, when paleontologists took a look at, this bone, at, the, at these bones, they realized that they were definitely much older. Um, so the first reconstruction that was done of this individual, you, you have seen them everywhere. This is a very kind of crooked, walk, knock, almost knuckle walking, hairy, scary brute. That's why the word Neanderthal is an insult nowadays, oftentimes. Here's the thing with this particular specimen. When this specimen was being presented at a conference, um, an, el an elderly German professor took stage and presented uh, an x-ray of a very similar specimen. And everybody at the conference was started asking, well, did you find another one, another creature like this? Where did you find these remains? And the professor said, no, you idiots, um, that's my x-rays. He was a very elderly gentleman with a very severe arthritis. And so were the remains that have been discovered of this type specimen Neanderthal. This was an old man, an old man who was stooped, who did not walk straight anymore, who was not in his peak condition. So even though this is a type specimen, it is not the best representation of the species as a whole. So first I want to go over scientific facts in this whole conversation. Um, scientific facts that are indisputable, scientific facts that are voiced by scientists but are disputed and then i want to go over my own conclusions speculations and also those conclusions and speculations that anthropologists paleontologists geneticists express only in private conversation because uh, in scientific community it is generally not a good idea to voice guesses until you have actual physical proof and some of these things are very hard to prove so for every fact, I'm going to specify whether I'm talking about an actual scientific fact, whether I'm talking about a scientific suggestion, or whether I'm speculating, just so that everybody understands what we're talking about. So um, Maria Mednikova uh, was one of uh, the scientists who was involved with the excavation of the Denisov cave, and the Denisov cave is in Altai. And she is the, the one from whom I have learned about... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, everything's fine. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. It's okay. It's fine, it's okay. So anyway, so she was the one who has mentioned the mammoth task diadem. She's also the one from whose um, interview I have learned about the latest genetic uh, discoveries that have recently been done on some of the new remains that were found in the Denisov cave. So that little uh, pink, pinky bone that was originally used for the genetic analysis of those remains, uh, it was a bone that belonged to a little girl, maybe 11 to 13 years old. And uh, when they did further studies on this particular bone, now I'm sure, I assume everybody knows that the Neanderthal DNA has been decoded and that the modern human DNA has been decoded, just in case I want to voice that. So this little girl's DNA, shows that um, her mother was actually a, ne a Neanderthal and her father was a Denisovian. What's more interesting is that her mother is more closely related to Neanderthals, not from the Altai region, region where she was found at, but from the Central European region where a very distinct genetic population of, Neander of Neanderthals lived, which shows you the migration ranges of this particular human species. Moreover, um, her father, who was himself a Denisovian, shows in his lineage several thousand years back a mixture of Neanderthal as well. So what we see here is that in that cave, we have a population that is repeatedly intermixing with itself. Now, in this case, we only see um, clear scientific, and this is clear scientific information, we only see clear scientific proof of Neanderthal and Denisovian admixture, but there are other hybrids that have been found to to various degrees, one even being near 20-80% between Cro-Magnon and uh, Neanderthal. So it seems like rather than being three completely distinct species, as I'm sure all of you were taught in high school, um, that the, did not contribute in any way, shape or form to modern humans, the Neanderthals at least, these were actually very fluid populations that actively exchanged not only knowledge information and other aspects of their being, but also literally genetic material. Um, so, and 
just like just a little side note on decorations before I forget to talk about. I want to um, with the mammoth task diadem decorations to us today are, are oftentimes just literally decorations. They're there to look pretty. While in tribal societies, oftentimes any element of decoration, whether it is face paint or it is some sort of jewelry or um, design of clothing, color of clothing, hairstyle, anything like that, it's a way of nonverbal communication. A tribes person, um, even today Siberian um, uh, people of um, people who live more traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle, upon meeting a stranger, even a stranger who does not speak their own language at all, can easily tell a lot about that individual. They can tell what age they are, they can tell what tribe they belong to, um, whether or not they are married or single, whether or not they are a successful hunter or not, whether what their rank within the tribe, and a lot of other information. So they, every time we talk about jewelry, decorations of any kind, I just want you to keep in mind that this is not something that was done for fun. This is an essential form of basically indicating who you are not that different from the modern military insignia, for example, or gang attire, where certain colors and certain ways of wearing your clothing signal to other members of the same society or closely related groups what, who, how you are and what it is that you represent. So um, interest in 2018, there were some interesting um, discoveries made regarding the hunting tactics of Neanderthals. There, the debate has been happening for a long time whether or not Neanderthals were able to throw spears. The reason why this debate was taking place is because in Neanderthals, um, we see a lot more severe physical damage and injuries, a lot more than in the Cro-Magnon population that clearly has resulted from very close up interaction with prey animals. And uh, the debate for that reason was happening whether or not they were actually able to throw projectile objects. Uh, in 2018, a study came out, and the study was based on a deer that was found in Germany with clear um, sign of impact from a spear, most likely a wooden spear, in its lower abdomen reg region. And it, the impact was so intense that it actually, it was visible on the bone, so it could be forensically start, uh, studied. And so, of course, scientists seized on, that, on their opportunity to study that particular trace mark to find out um, whether or not this was a thrown weapon or whether or not it was a weapon that was thrust into the animal at close range. And the reason why they were so interested in this information is because the only human population at that time in that region were Neanderthals. So the scientists have concluded that this particular spear was actually thrust at close range, at close range and it was not thrown. But some interesting factors came up from the location of the wound, the nature of the wound, the region where this uh, spear was thrust into is the same region that in, in ethnographic studies is shown hunters attempt to or usually do hit an animal in in order to, to cause very severe and very quick blood loss so that the animal does not run off and they don't have to put forth the effort of dragging the carcass of a very large, very heavy animal back to whatever location they want to either eat it at or butcher it at. So it, what this shows us, this shows us a lot about Neanderthal behavior and their cognition. From this, we know that, first of all, they, be, they hunted in very similar conservation techniques to modern um, hunter and gatherer societies, that they understood animal anatomy, and that they, their reasoning in this sense was not very different from modern human populations. Now, um, if, in fact, Neanderthals were not able to throw spears, and there are studies, repeated studies, that suggest that physiology, the anatomy of Neanderthal's shoulder, did not allow them to actually be able to throw a spear. Now, that's very hard for us to imagine because modern homo sapiens, all modern homo sapiens, even if you've never lifted a hand in your life, you're still physically geared to be able to throw projectile objects. Um, Studies suggest that morphology, that bone structure, muscle structure of Neanderthals did not permit for them to throw spears. This is scientific um, suggestion. Now, here's my speculation. I am very skeptical on that particular point. And the reason why I'm very skeptical on that particular point is because any primate, and not just primates, are capable of throwing projectile objects. There may have been certain limitations to physical morphology or certain dif uh, differences from what we see in the modern population, but I cannot imagine that they were completely incapable of throwing anything at all. 
Um, there might have been some limitation as far as to the range or the accuracy, but there is this debate on whether or not projectile thrown spears was something that Neanderthals could use. And if you can't use those kind of hunting objects, then you have to coordinate your hunt very differently than you would in a situation where you can distance um, a hidden animal. So that again shows us a high level of cognition, cooperation, intelligence, planning, and so on and so forth. Um, now, another thing that came up in 2018 and uh, has been hotly debated ever since, which I find exceptionally fascinating, is that when you have a cave, and this is to the subject of cave art, when you have cave art and um, you want to date that cave art, you can only do it one way, and that is if the individuals who drew the cave art use charcoal, because then you can do carbon dating. But if they used um, plant-based pigmentations, mineral pigmentation, anything like that, well, with plant, you would be able to do it, but with mineral pigments, you cannot really carbon date that layer at all. So you have no idea when this cave art was put on the cave wall. So a new method has been recently developed that a lot of scientists are very excited about and a lot of scientists are very unexcited about and very skeptical of. And it is urinatorium uh, calcite dating. And what it is, is when you have a cave wall where water is dripping and somebody draws something on the cave wall, as the water drips, it brings down minerals from the surface and those minerals slowly settle over the original drawing. And uh, by dating roughly when the minerals were deposited versus when the wall of the cave um, was originally formed, so the layers that the artwork, I guess, is sandwiched in between, you can give a very rough range. And it's a very wide range. It's not very accurate, but at least it tells you the earliest it could have been and the latest it could have been. So that's the only way they really have of dating some cave art that does not have any organic material associated with it. And so there is a site, um, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember exactly, I know it's in Europe, where they have been um, art, cave art that's been known for a long time. Now, this is not the cave art that you typically think of. There are no bison, horses, there's nothing like that. These are geometrical signs, there's zigzags, there's dots, sometimes handprints. Most of it is very abstract kind of um, symbols. As a matter of fact, these are the kind of symbols that are seen grouped in a very interesting way throughout Europe. Some of these symbols repeat only over very small territory to where other kinds of symbols are more widely used. And so what scientists think at this point in time and is, is that this is something similar to what's called Tanga in the Siberian cultures. And it is a clan sign. Some of these symbols might be literally, or imagine a gang sign, you know, when somebody is tagging their territory. So some of these signs might have been universal, maybe for good luck or for any some sort of other meaning to where other signs may have been literally stamps of a specific clan marking their territory. Now, the dating that happened in 2018 and that is still up for debate, even though it's been a couple of years, is put some of those signs, and only some of them, not all of them, in a time period when there were no modern humans in Europe at all. And if that is the case, then it would show that it was Neanderthals who invented this sort of um, geometric labeling kind of um, cave art, and not as it's been considered mostly modern humans. Majority of scientists are very skeptical of the study because of where the samples were taken, how they were taken. Um, moreover, there's talk that the team who did the study are like me, are very much pro Neanderthal, and they really, really, really want to prove that Neanderthals did have art. Um, so this is up for debate. Um, my own personal spe uh, speculation on the subject matter, I believe that absolutely that Neanderthals, Denisovians, and likely a lot of other hominid species did have art. Whether or not it is what we would consider to be art is a whole different subject matter. But we will talk about it later. There are other evidence of these alternative humanities, understanding at least such things as, I mean, we already talked about Denisovians, such things as decoration. They just may have not done the cave wall art as the modern humans uh, started doing. Um, so the next one, and in general about cave art, I just want to say, Again, majority of people, when they think of cave art, they think of these very beautiful, very outstanding, very magnificent figures and, uh, you know, animal shapes. Most of, the, uh, most of the really exciting cave art that is discovered throughout Europe is really dot, dot, zigzag, zigzag, 
squiggle. What these things meant, we have no idea. But an interesting thing that is often associated with this particular kind of um, abstract cave art is that it, it is, first of all, it's always in a cave that is not habit, habit, habituated by, that's not lived in regularly by whatever population left those markings. But there are certain surfaces within that cave that are polished almost to mirror shine, which is a sign of ritual behavior, of repeated ritual behavior within those caves or those cave uh, systems where over a period of time, multitude of individuals walked through specific passage and touched certain walls, certain places over and over and over. So this is definitely evidence of very, very early ritual behavior, um, which I personally would go as far as call religious or cult behavior of some form, though scientists, of course, are very careful to not use those kind of labels because religion does not fossilize very well. So unless we have artifacts of the religion, chances are it's gonna be very hard to prove for very early uh, ancestors of modern humans. So another thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, Cro-Magnons or the, 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 the anatomically modern humans, even though they were all humans, they all came out of Africa. And they came out of Africa relatively recently comparing to the Neanderthals and the Denisovians that were already living there. So they were basically the illegal aliens kind of invading other people's territory and taking their jobs, I guess. They were not very well adapted for this environment. These were people who were very tall, very narrow bodied, very muscular, but in a very kind of toned runner sort of streamlined shape. They were very dark skinned because they just came out of Africa. And a quick sidetrack on the skin color. Skin color has nothing really to do Skin color is a factor of genetics that is not directly linked to any other factor. It is mostly impacted by what region of the planet you happen to live at, what altitude, and how much um, UV exposure you get, really. Um, lighter skin is much more beneficial for reproduction and uh, for avoidance um, um, of lack, I can't even think of the right term. There's a certain vitamin or mineral in the body that- but well, it's not just vitamin D, but the folic acid, something like that. There's there's an essential, basically, there's an essential essential element in reproduction that is required that people can only get from the sun. If you get too much of it, that's a problem because um, you have problem reproducing, and if you don't get enough of it, you have deficiencies and you have problems reproducing. So lighter skin is always an adaptation to uh, lesser sunlight, and darker skin is always an adaptation to brighter sunlight, specifically UV rays. Um, so a group of people that migrates from the, you know, equatorial uh, regions to somewhere that's, I don't know, like Norway, over thousands and thousands of years is likely to go lighter just because that's what they evolved to do. To where a person with, you know, a bunch of Nordic Vikings who moved to somewhere near the equator or to the top of the mountain, they're more likely to change their skin color. So skin color is something that's one of the most variable really factors. But the first cro magnets that came out of Africa were definitely dark skinned because that's that was their environment. That's what they were adapted for. They were equatorial um, adapted creatures. They were not very used to the colder and to them rel relatively colder climates of Europe, of Eurasia. When they encountered these Neanderthal species, uh, these is a, this is a species that has come to this region much, much longer. Um, been, been in that region for much, much longer, come there much earlier, and has had, <clears throat> excuse me, an opportunity not only to adapt, not only to adapt to their climates um, in a cultural and behavioral way, but they also adapted to the, to the climates physically. Neanderthal type body type, Neand Neanderthal structure was very different from these cro magnets that they would soon encounter. They were much shorter, they were stockier. Um, an average cro magnet was about 180 centimeters, that's what, about 6.5 feet, plus or minus. They were really tall. Early cro magnets were extremely tall. They were mm -hmm. six feet in, uh, between 6 feet and 6.5 feet. To where Neanderthals on average were fairly short. Okay. Yeah, about 5'2". And then Neanderthals, on the other hand, were very heavy set, and not in an obese kind of way, but in a very wide, I mean, we, Think about your typical, you know, gnome or troll. You have very wide, very muscular shoulders, stocky body, wide rib cage, um, 
very compact body mass. Uh, these were formid formidable foes for the Cro-Magnons because Cro-Magnons were taller, but they were more fragile and they were more less physically endowed, I guess, in the sense of muscle and strength, to where Neanderthals really had a lot of just raw brute physical force in them, and that's both males and females. They were very muscular, muscular individuals. Um, there are bones that are found of Neanderthals, even um, of individuals who are not particularly, who were not particularly outstanding in the, their level of physical activity. They show such, because when a muscle grows on the bone, like for example, if somebody is a, is a bodybuilder and if they work out a lot, their bone starts thickening in certain points to support that muscle mass. So Neanderthal bones, they show extreme muscle mass that even today's, you know, heavy lifters and the bodybuilders could never match in their entire lifetime. Um, they lived, Neanderthals have lived in a very resources scarce, very um, harsh and demanding environment. Um, with the winters being there, plant food was uh, available to them, but it was less available than it would have been in a more moderate climate. So, in particularly the European Neanderthals during the Ice Age were very, were probably the most carnivorous human species that, I, well, primate species that ever existed, really. Um, for a long time, it was uh, suggested that Neanderthals pretty much ate exclusively meat, or more or less, yeah, exclusively meat. And then some analysis of a um, dental um, plaque, plaque, plaque was done, and other analysis of Neanderthal uh, remains you know, were done, and it was discovered that actually their diet oftentimes heavily uh, consisted of various uh, plant matters, such as tubulars, which they would dig up just like Cro-Magnons. Um, of various other plant material. Um, and uh, very recently came a discovery that Neanderthals, because it was considered that Neanderthals were meat eaters and did not really do much fish or shells, to where one of the adv advantages of Cro-Magnus was considered to be the fact that they did use the marine resources. Well, it's been shown that not only did Neanderthals in certain populations <coughs> heavily use um, uh, uh, the marine resources available to them, but that they were acquiring shells that, that are at pretty great depth in the, in the sea. And even there were some skeletons found with the swimmer ear deformation, which is something that only happens when an individual repeatedly dives for, to very great depth to acquire most likely resources at the bottom of the sea. Uh, so yes, Neanderthals were not just you know, brute hunters. They were definitely capable of uh, acquiring varied food resources. Um, okay. So where most likely the one of the primary meetings uh, happened between these two species, these two kinds of humans, was in modern day Israel, Palestine area, where the crow magnets were coming out of Africa, where the resources were getting scarce because there was just a lot of them there. And there was also different climactic changes taking place. While the Neanderthals were escaping the Ice Age maximum, which was advancing on their um, traditional territories. So what we have in Palestine really, and this is something that geneticists are just now barely starting to acknowledge, but something that anthropologists, physical anthropologists, who actually work with the bones, have mentioned and known and been very comfortable with actually for, I don't know, decades, is that, for example, the Palestine uh, Israel population seems to be, have been mostly hybrid population really. You have such variability between um, the diff from individual to individual in that particular location, to where some individuals are showing more Neanderthal traits, and some individuals are showing more um, modern human, well, modern Homo sapiens Cro-Magnon traits. And there's, I mean, somebody might have a Neanderthal eyebrow ridge and very um, modern human chin. Neanderthals that they did not have many, much of a chin. Their face was more like triangular shaped, to where it protruded for forward, and the they're actually, and another thing about Neanderthals I need to say is that their brain capacity was greatly above, significantly above that of their counterparts of Cro-Magnons. Um, their brain capacity was around 1600. Um, Cro-Magnons at the time um, sh showed a sudden jump in the, their brain capacity, which nowadays scientists tentatively attribute to potential hybridization with the Neanderthals. That is something that humans then lost down the road when once it got further and further away from that original intermixing event. And nowadays, the, you know, there's actually a tendency for people's brains to 
slowly decreased now. It hasn't been really long enough to tell whether or not this is a permanent uh, evolutionary trend or it's just a temporary kind of a zigzag and a average wave. But, um, but yes, Neanderthals definitely had a larger brain than uh, we do today. So, so I went over, what, what else do I need to go over on the Neanderthal traits? David, any thoughts? Anybody else, any thoughts? I'm gonna stop for a second and see if anybody wants to say something. The only thing that I can think of, which um, you kind of already covered, but um, I always find interesting is that um, obviously because Neanderthals had to deal with such a harsh environment, is that they were probably partly uh, better adapted simply because they could stay warmer with a, a minimal amount of clothing. I'm sure that they did make many tools. They probably did use clothing of some kind. I can't say for sure, but their structure was probably very well suited to those climates because they could process a lot of calories and they had a better ratio of body mass and metabolism to, you know, surface area, but um, yeah, the rest of this is mostly new to me, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, no, that you're absolutely correct on that, um, and I was going to say one of the factors of, of Neanderthals really was their, um, it's speculated that they had a fairly high metabolic rate because they did need to keep themselves warm, and they did sustain, <clears throat> sustain themselves mostly on um, non-carbon, but rather a, a protein diet. Yeah, with probably probably a little bit similar to what say the uh, maybe the Inuits and the Eskimos even eat today actually you know give or take but um, as far as the brain capacity I've always found that interesting it's a new concept to me and also um, yeah I don't have any source material of course to add but um, more just questions than anything but um, also with uh, Neanderthals I do find it interesting that, um, as from what I've read in the past at least, they were probably very social creatures, so to speak. It, I don't think that there's really any dispute about that even. And we will get to that here in a minute because I'm, I'm just going over the hard facts first and then I'm kind of going to get into more speculative stuff. So. Okay, yeah. Sounds good. A couple things that I would point out. Um, most of that time that the Neanderthals lived in, in uh, Europe and Eurasia, uh, there was about 100,000 of them. Uh, probably the densest region of them was in France, uh, southern France, uh, about 3,000. Uh, so we're looking at really small populations, probably uh, eight to maybe 25 people uh, for bands. Assumedly, there was some kind of clan structure. Um, another thing that, uh, uh, yes, they were very cold adapted. One of the biggest things was, see this big nose? They had one about three times the size. <laughs> and uh, that was for cooling or warming air uh, Arctic air or polar air, basically. Uh, the other thing, um, apparently, while they did have a lot of, um, while they did have a lot of cultural, of physical cultural adaptations and stuff, it was relatively conservative compared to safety. Uh, as, as far as their stone technologies, they didn't, it didn't move as fast. I know I'm getting some disagreement, but uh, there was a lot of adaptivity towards the very end of it when they came in contact with Cro-Magnon. Uh, but for much of between 375,000 years ago and maybe 50,000 years ago, or maybe 60 even, uh, it didn't change that much. And so I tend to wonder if their brain, say, brain size 
didn't have more to do with instinctive memories. And, and, um, you mean, you mean to say as like, as in, uh, intuitive? Yeah, and, right. More, I believe they may have well been more intuitive and more in tap with their ancestors' memories. And less focused on the, uh, the sort yeah, of complex problem-solving brain that right. homo sapiens tend to resort to. And, and that's speculation, but... Yeah. Uh, this would have been the perfect podcast for me to be able to have my video working because I have a lot of those Neanderthal features that Julie was just talking about. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, after a conversation that she and I had, I, I can't even tell you how many months ago, um, I actually looked into getting tested specifically for Neanderthal DNA. All right, can everybody hear me? Without any weird feedback, I'm terribly sorry about it. I'll edit yeah. it out. Coming in good. Okay, so things that we know that uh, modern human populations have inherited from other parallel humanities, um, uh, specifically from um, uh, Neanderthals, and that's the Altai uh, region, Neanderthal population. Modern humans have um, most likely um, in, uh, inherited um, diabetes, specifically the type of diabetes that is developed by people as they age. And that most likely had to do with their metabolic rate and the just different feeding habits. But that is something that is fairly closely associated. Scientists officially think today their publications, uh, peer-reviewed publications in this regard. Um, that diabetes might have been something that was left over to modern humans from their Neanderthal ancestors. From, um, from the Denisovians, uh, one thing that there's and there's a second thing, and this is where I'm going to be very careful because I do not want to offend anyone. But uh, the very first uh, thing that uh, the Denisovians most likely um, left contributed to modern human populations is the altitude resistance that is seen by the Tibetan uh, population, which is a mutation that shows up very recently in human um, history. And there is a very good chance that that might have been a, a trait that migrated into the population from a mixture. There's also some debate that some of the Inuit traits may have been either very sudden mutation, um, which does happen occasionally, but evolution is one of those things that really even 100,000 years is not sufficient time for it to really set in, or it might have been inherited from mixing with other people. Now, right here, I want to make a disclaimer that I will repeat several times during this whole podcast series. I have... Um, I'm very aware of the current subject matter of race and uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, the entire equality and so on and so forth and various uh, injustices, um, discussions that are taking place. Here's my view on this subject matter. The modern human population, all of the modern human population, anything from pygmy, pygmies to um, Norwegians, you know, your typical Vikings, anything from people living in Papua New Guinea to, I don't know, just pick them Inuit for that matter are very closely related. They actually, the human genetic pool right now is fairly uniform, comparatively speaking, to what it used to be in the past. So the racial differences, or so-called racial differences, that are at the heart of the debate and the hurt and a lot of tragedy right now, um, is really nothing comparing to the kind of variation that our ancestors came across in their encounters. The difference between, again, an Inuit and, uh, you know, and the Tibetan um, is not very significant statistically. But by the same token, here's where I kind of want to venture into dangerous territory. I value the variety in human populations. I think that the variety of any organism's population is what is important, what enables it to survive, what makes it different and interesting and unique. And so to deny the fact that there's variation in modern human population, I think is also very negative and very unfair to those populations and those individuals and those cultures that have their own unique traits that are uniquely adapted. And to equate everybody and to try to level everybody out is first of all is unrealistic because people, even in our modern globalized world, are still more likely to intermarry with those who are closest to them physically closest to them. 
Second of all, uh, it's, it's not right. I, if you create a population where everybody is uh, genetically uniform and equally equal in every way, you do not have that pool of uh, resistance to illnesses or to ver very natural conditions. And I think that in the Western culture right now, the subject of potential interbreeding and the way that it has affected modern human populations is very carefully avoided because oftentimes it is associated with the concepts of racism. Now, I personally like Neanderthals and Denisovians a heck of a lot better than modern humans, I'll be honest with you. So to me, the idea that some other unique and special species, a species that has left its trace in my blood or the blood of my friend has contributed somehow to one or another trait of a population is not in any way a derogatory idea. It is a fascinating, exciting, and very positive idea. And really, I mean, uh, you know, most Europeans have Neanderthal admixture. Most people in Asia have some degree of Denisovian and Neanderthal admixture. There are likely other populations of now extinct parallel humanities that also uh, have contributed to what we consider to be modern humans that we have not yet discovered. But to know that these ancestors still live on in us, these but these really elves, you know, these magical creatures, you know, elves, trolls, gnomes, everything that we want to encounter, these other humanities that have inspired our stories and inspired our imagination for so many, um, gosh, millennia, really. To me, that is a very positive thing, something to be very happy and very proud of. So that being said, and I just want to make it very clear, um, there is some suggestion that there have was some ad admixture, specifically with the Inuit population because the Inuit population does show some unique uh, morphological and physiological capacities that to me makes that particular all populations that are currently uh, under the umbrella term of Inuit, but there are certain groups that have some unique adaptations that uh, we will discuss when we get closer to that, you know, later in the human history. But uh, there's definitely variable traits in different human populations, and I would not be surprised if some of these traits were actually picked up as something that was very advantageous by encountering a localized, uh, isolated population of some sort of uh, humans um, and admixing with them. That's, that's my take on, on the subject. So, and while we're on the subject, I just want to say that um, um, so uh, the Denisovian um, DNA is found widely spread in the Papua New Guinea, Australia, and some parts of Asia to where Europe and Asia um, has uh, definitely has Neanderthal admixture. There are parts of Africa that don't seem to have that admixture, but show another admixture of a yet another trace population that is di different and distinct from all of the above. But scientists don't really know what it is. Of course, there was a lot of migration back into Africa over centuries and eons. And uh, um, there is a lot of African populations that do show those admixtures, but it's hard to tell whether or not they originated there or they were brought you know, by the returning migrants. Most likely because we know that Neanderthals were adapted to the colder climates. They were the ones who originally colonized the uh, Middle East and uh, colonized uh, Europe and Asia, some parts of Asia. And we know that Denisovians were the ones who colonized some of those uh, Asian regions as well. Uh, there's a good chance that, uh, you know, that is DNA that was introduced by return migrations. And so the last two uh, genetic, little genetic uh, uh, topics that have been, you know, proven. First of all, there was a huge debate whether or not Neanderthals were capable of speech. I find that debate ridiculous, um, xenopho xenophobic, and racist. Um, and the reason why is because here's, here's the story of Neanderthals. Since they've been discovered, pe people in general, scientists, pop culture, everybody, artists, have seemed to have gone out of their way to show them as Kind of primitive brutes. They're drawn in, a, in a poses and in, a, in kind of appearances and in, with facial expressions that make them look like giant idiots. They are generally shown as shaggy, half ape, half man. And this is a tendency that seems to have, even though science has moved quite significantly forward, this tendency seems to be so deeply embedded in the psyche of humanity, of modern humanity in general, that consistently Neanderthals have been stripped off and denied their humanity even when the facts are clear. Now this is partially my speculation. A lot of this is actually based on voiced and published opinions of you know researchers who are known in the field. For example, the subject of speech for the longest time Neanderthals couldn't speak. 
well, they have the right areas in their brain. Well, wait, maybe their throat was not built the right way. Look, their throat is built a different way, so they could only make squeaky sounds, so they definitely couldn't speak. Well, okay, squeaky sounds are still speech. Um, the, for example, it's been proven through by geneticists that they have the FOX2 gene, which is uh, one of the essential genes for um, grammar and being able to speak. Nowadays, almost no scientist that I know of would openly state that they believe that Neanderthals were not capable of speech. That would be a, a ridiculous assumption to make. Uh, these are complex people with very compl complex behaviors, ritual behaviors even, that are hard to debate. Um, that in, that in plain and possible in a, in a creature that is incapable of clear, detailed planning, communication, and reliance of ideas. Uh, there's actually some debate on whether or not uh, Homo erectus were capable of speech. My personal belief that they definitely were capable of speech and that the whole process of acquisition of speech slowly um, began, um, slowly began, um, and it was not uh, an instant event, it was a gradual adaptation, gradual evol evolution of the people. Um, so, I mean, to minimal communication, to progression, to, you know, the very complex kind of language we use today. Uh, just, just to interject something real quick, um, I mean, I think it would possibly depend upon how one defines speech, but uh, it seems like many animals communicate with very complex patterns of, of sound that comes out of their throats. And I mean, speech is obviously important to Homo sapiens, at least, because it's one of the reasons why we have the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah. uh, many, many animals have complex speech patterns. It would be hard to believe that Neanderthals didn't. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's non it. nonetheless, that's something that they've been denied for a very long time. Another thing that, uh, you know, Neanderthals been, um, I mean, next, next big subject was, well, maybe they aged a lot faster. Maybe they grew up faster, they became adults faster, they had shorter lifespans, they had different uh, speed of mat maturation than uh, modern humans. There is not really good evidence for that. I mean, everybody in those days lived uh, short and, you know, intense lives, really. Um, then there's uh, the whole bunch of uh, extinction theories. You know, did they go extinct because they were stupider than modern humans? Did they go extinct because the modern humans, they were incapable of fighting of disease that the modern humans brought? Did they go extinct because they were not as quick to evolve what David was talking about? Here's the thing, they were living in a very conservative environment. You've got to understand that the number of Neanderthals, physical number of these individuals on the territory of, uh, let's say, Europe, which was a fairly harsh environment, was very, very limited. They lived in small family groups. There was not a lot of resources. You had to limit your reproduction. It was difficult to find mates because your nearest tribe might be, I don't know, 30 days, of, you know, track away. Um, there was a lot of inbreeding going on. Um, there was a, a geneticist showed that there was a lower genetic diversity in European Neanderthals, for example, than Neanderthals outside of Europe because it was such a harsh environment. And because, well, I mean, a lot of individuals just died cutting off the gene pool. Um, and there was a lot of, they did not really, here's the thing, when, when a population, any animal population is in a comfortable in an environment where they exist, there is really not a push to evolve. I mean, the, what David was saying, yes, their tools, their, uh, you know, tool making skills, they were conserved, what? conserved at the level that they were conserved at because they worked. I mean, if it works, don't break it, right? Uh, and that we see that even in modern ethnographic studies. Now, when they ran, when they encountered this whole new, you know, way of living, you know, because when Cro-Magnons came into Europe, we, we're talking about overwhelming flood. I mean, if you if you look at it from a distance, uh, the, just numbers were significantly different. Cro-Magnons lived in larger family groups. They were they they kept coming because there was an endless well not an endless but there was quite a few of them back home and it just was an ongoing wave of migration. It was literally you know rather than Neanderthals going extinct, really modern scientists are leaning more towards of that to, to the idea of absorption, to where they were literally absorbed into modern human population because they were not that numerous to begin with. Um, Original hybrids of Neanderthals and humans show up to at least 20% of Neanderthals genes, genes as much as 30%. That the number of genes that is clearly visible to scientists today is, uh, it, it looks like it, it went up and then it slowly plateaued off and then started going down. I, okay, I want to say my standpoint on geneticists. Genetics is an awesome science. They can teach us a lot. They're really good at what they do. The problem is it, it is a really new science. And I feel that when geneticists are working with material of living creatures where they can correlate their research results to the actual 
individual creature or group of creatures that they're working with, their results are more or less reliable. When we're talking about extinct species, especially extremely archaic extinct species with uh, quite degraded DNA, like such as, for example, Neanderthals, Denisovians, the, error, the margin for error is far greater. And because they don't have a physical specimen to look at and compare their results to, we get things when you know we get publications, oh, all Neanderthals had red hair and pale skin, green eyes. Oh, no, they all were dark skin. No, they were all blue eyed. No, and it's the same team of geneticists publishing you know, one month to another. It's because they, they get their results, their results are accurate, they have no idea to, how to interpret them sometimes yet because there's nothing really, to, it, it's a brand new field of science. So I'm very cautious about um, jumping on any new discoveries that are just solely genetically based. I kind of like to correlate those to actual anthropological, because anthropologists who work with the remains, they know their bones. You know, and you can tell, I mean, if you attentive enough anthropologist, you can reconstruct, there, there have been instances where um, a scientist was able to pretty much reconstruct an entire animal from just a femur bone. Just because when you know rough morphology of an animal and it, you can guess, I mean, it's just a matter of expertise. And those kind of physical anthropologists, f physical paleontologists are less and less prevalent, pre prevalent today just because it is easier and quicker to you know punch everything into the computer and the years of expertise of hands-on experience that it takes to learn those details to develop that intuition they kind of being left in the previous centuries but those few and uh, you know physical anthropologists whom i talked to they they kind of laugh at all the genetic discoveries because they already knew about them um they knew about them like i said decades ago um, they, they knew that that particular specimen was a hybrid. As a matter of fact, one thing that I have heard from a specific uh, um, physical anthropologist is that he has strong doubts about the Neanderthal DNA that was uh, deciphered back in whatever year it was ago. He's, he has a strong suspicion that the samples that they were using were actually from hybrid population. So most likely they do not have pure um, Neanderthal DNA. They have DNA that is already heavily admixed with modern human DNA, not in the sense of it, that it's polluted with the scientists, but basically Cro-Magnon and, uh, and Neanderthals have already interbred, and the specimen that they used as their type specimen for their DNA analysis most likely was already a hybrid um, individual. And uh, geneticists seem to repeat, they seem to ignore everything that the anthropologists have done for like 50, 60 years, and like trailblaze and come out with this, woo, we just found out this cool information. It's, and it's either, okay, everybody already knows that, awesome, or no, you guys are completely off track. And that's, that's bound to happen as they, you know, as the science of, you know, genetic, of study, studying of, you know, polygenetics is growing and developing and kind of finding its way in the world. I really do wish they would sit down and actually read some publications that already exist out there. Because, I mean, maybe it's good to not be prejudiced, but maybe it's sometimes just a silly waste of effort. But anyway, that's my little spiel on genetics. Guys, I think we've been going at this, I don't know for how long. Do you want to... Not an hour. Do you guys want to cut it off here and then, because I still got it, like I said, Neanderthals is like, I have a, all the cool, fun material I haven't even touched. We just went over the basics. So, um, I, I would uh, interject again to say that uh, I think that with this type of topic, it might take another couple podcasts, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah, that's right. what I'm thinking. It's likely. Um, there's still plenty of questions that I can't even remember that I had, <laughs> but um, I guess we could cut it off here. We've been going at it for about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's something that anybody else wants to discuss about what we covered. Uh, maybe we discuss it later. Um, Dustin, David, anyone? I agree. I agree. The, David agrees. Dustin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I would have to drop fairly soon anyway. So. Yeah, that's why I figured. Okay, now if anybody is watching this or anybody who is actually physically, well, not semi, non-physically present, electronically present, if you, if there's a particular subject that I have mentioned that you would like to have an actual reference for, um, you know, comment on the video on the YouTube, I will post the actual reference. It would take me forever to find physical references, references for each and every publication, but I promise you that if I'm telling you that it is a scientific fact, there is an existing peer-reviewed publication that will back up my words. Now, if it's speculation, sorry guys, that's my speculation, I will stick by it. But if you would like a specific reference, if you're curious to learn more about a specific topic, just hit me up and I'll make that available. I think that's about it. Awesome. Good to me.
Okay, thank you, everyone. Awesome. All right, thank you. Okay. Everyone be well. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.